Order, and uh, we will begin with uh, questions to the DRD Minister, and I call Ms. Judith Cochran. Ms. Cochran. Thank you. Question number one, please. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, during the period 1st of May 2011 until 31st of March this year, 216 locations within the Eastern Divisional Area have been assessed for the provision of traffic calming measures. In the same period, my department has invested approximately £3 million in traffic calming measures throughout Northern Ireland, including approximately £1 million within Eastern Division. This is perhaps uh, an opportune time to advise members that the operational boundaries of Transport NI changed on 1 April 2014 to reflect the new council boundaries which are due to take effect in April 2015. For example, Belfast, Castlereagh and Lisburn council areas remain within the Eastern Divisional Operational Area, whereas Carrick Fergus and Newton Abbey Borough Councils are now part of the Northern Division Operational Area. North Down Borough Council is now included in the uh, new, uh, uh, new Southern Division Operational Area. Thank you. And I call Ms. Cochran for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask, um, would um, of those areas that have been assessed, what percentage of them were actually progressed? And what is the Minister doing uh, to allocate additional resources to the uh, clearly overstretched traffic, traffic calming programme? As I'm sure we've all had you know, the similar response that says whilst well, the traffic calming scheme would be beneficial, there are other schemes in the area deemed to be of greater priority. Can I thank the, uh, the member for her uh, supplementary question and, and, and to agree that um, we are uh, oversubscribed uh, very much in terms of traffic calming uh, uh, requests. Uh, those requests are very fairly uh, and expertly dealt with in terms of uh, their assessment by uh, my uh, uh, officials, and uh, we, we will continue to, uh, to do that. Uh, I can say that um, in terms of um, additional funding, uh, my department has uh, submitted uh, uh, bids totalling um, 5.2 million for local transport and safety measures, which includes traffic calming as part of the June 2014 monitoring round. And obviously, we would be hopeful that uh, that, that bid would be met. Mr. Danny Kenahan for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, I too was going to ask a, a question on the funding, but it seems that we have a, a difference in opinion on whether traffic calming actually works with many people being against it and I think there are studies I wondered if the minister would clarify um, what is thought of traffic calming and starting with road bumps as a preferable way forward I'm grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question and indeed uh, there are differing opinions in terms of the impact of, of traffic calming uh, uh, measures however um, I, I, I can um, confirm um, that uh, they are still very much sought, of, uh, sought by, uh, by uh, local communities who um, are, are concerned perhaps that uh, uh, dangers to, um, to, to particular housing areas uh, or whatever, um, uh, and of course uh, the, all of that has to be borne in mind, and that's why careful consideration. Uh, is given to all applications and every assessment uh, that is made. Thank you. Oh, okay, to see for a supplementary. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister confirm that his department have no plans to implement the MAD policy of traffic calming in town centres by imposing blanket 20 mile an hour speed restrictions, as have been requested by some members of the Green Party and other fringe parties. I'm grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question, and, and uh, uh, seems to be intent on pursuing his, uh, his issues with, with the, the, the leader of the Green Party. Um, even though I understand he was a former pupil of his, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think uh, there, the issue of, of, of the implementation of, of 20 miles per hour um, schemes is being carefully looked at. We are bringing forward actually pilot schemes uh, to better inform uh, our view on that. Um, and uh, I think that's a sensible approach rather than um, uh, a, a widespread change, uh, implementing perhaps uh, changes that 
people and communities are not quite prepared for. Thank you. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Question number two, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, the uh, £10 million uh, capital investment in, in the sewage infrastructure in Bangor is split into six phases. Phases one and two, located at Luke's Point and Bangor Marina, are presently under construction and expected to be completed towards the end of June 2014. Phase 3, which includes a major wastewater pumping station replacement planned within the grounds of Castle Park, uh, and um, an additional pumping station plan, uh, sorry, uh, is targeted to start. Uh, sorry, an additional pumping station planned for within the grounds of Clandyboy Primary School is targeted to start in autumn 2014 for 12-month duration. This timescale is subject to obtaining necessary statutory approvals, including uh, archaeological requirements within Castle Park and the grounds of Bangor Abbey. Phases four to six of the investment, which are uh, smaller in scale, uh, are located in the, in the areas of Brompton, Stricklands, Carnalee and Bangor West, and are programmed co uh, for completion with NIW's PC15 Capital Works programme covering the period 2015 to 2021. I call Mr. Cree for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his uh, full, re full response. Minister, what measures have been put in place to uh, control disruption during this period, and particularly with other works that are also ongoing at this time? Grateful to the member for his uh, supplementary question, uh, and indeed for his, uh, his interest as a, uh, as a local member for North Down. Um, uh, uh, on the issue, the member will appreciate and, and, and um, support, I think, uh, that, that the, the scheme will improve um, and provide important infrastructure for homes and businesses uh, in the area. Uh, and of course, as with any major scheme, there will be some disruption. However, uh, the, the majority of the planned work uh, throughout the town uh, will not uh, take place on the public road, and therefore disruption to traffic will be limited and kept to a minimum. Um, NIW have been asked to take steps to mitigate uh, any disruption. They are liaising with statutory agencies, including DSD and, uh, and DRD, and with North Down Borough Council, the Chamber of Commerce, and traders to ensure that good communication and healthy uh, cooperation uh, is the order of the day. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister, following on from my colleague's question, can the Minister give us an assurance that DRD will work with, on the sewage scheme as they, as they progress? Will they work with other contractors, primarily contractors now in, engaged through DSD, carrying out the public realm work? Will they do all that they can to minimise disruption during this busy summer period when we have so many tourists coming to an attractive place like Bangor and North Down? I'm grateful to the, uh, to the member for his uh, supplementary question. And I, I, I do indeed, uh, I am aware of uh, public comment in an article in a, in a, re, in a local newspaper um, claiming that um, uh, NIW was, was delaying uh, the, the, uh, the public realm works. Can I say that due to the necessity uh, of routing uh, the major pipe work along Abbey Street in, in Bangor to avoid risk of damaging elements of uh, Malachy's Wall, part of the larger medieval Bangor Abbey site, uh, and uh, itself uh, a site of international Christian heritage uh, significance, the Council and the DSD public realm contractor have uh, or has reprogrammed a section of work. Uh, along Abbey Street to allow NIW to lay their sewers before the public realm work proceeds uh, in that short section. Uh, this is a reprogram of the public work in a very short section of the overall scope uh, and will not delay uh, the overall program. And I think my answer indicates the level of cooperation between government departments and agencies. Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for agreeing to take a question from the leader of a fringe party, um, but I'm delighted I, I was elected and have the opportunity to do so. Um, could I ask the Minister um, how are residents who may be affected by, by these works being informed of the likely disruption? Well, I'm grateful uh, to, to, to the member, and uh, of course, the member has nothing to be modest about uh, and, and shouldn't seek to hide his light uh, uh, under a bushel, nor does he. But anyway. Could I, could I say that, 
<laughs> it, it is important that we, uh, that, 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 that we liaise with um, um, all uh, of those impacted upon, and, and, uh, and I know that uh, ANI Water, um, through uh, liaison with, with uh, the Council and other public representatives and, and indeed the other agencies, and not least the, the Chamber of Trade, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, and, uh, and residents to, to keep them informed of, of progress uh, and uh, likely um, scenarios that, which may impact uh, on their ability to, to, uh, to move freely. So all of that is taken on board and, and that will continue to be the case. Uh, and bef before I call you, Mr McKinney, just to uh, draw your attention to the fact that this is a constituency specific question, if that makes any difference to what you intend to say. Can I can I give it a try, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker? And I thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And clearly, improvement schemes like Bangor are welcome. But uh, uh, what steps has the Minister taken to avoid future heavy fines, where, as a result of our sewerage system falling beneath European standards? Thank you. Well, I think uh, that uh, is in itself quite a timely question in, in relation to uh, uh, this particular project, because. Um, uh, we want to uh, ensure that we um, uh, comply with, with European regulations in terms of our, our drinking water in that area uh, and that we don't uh, incur uh, uh, infractions. So um, I know that uh, NI Water plays its part um, in, in helping to meet um, the, uh, the more uh, stringent uh, standards that are laid out in the revised European Bathing Water Directive. Uh, and those standards are in place, uh, and, uh, and, and we, we have to um, uh, be aware of them. There's also, um, uh, obviously, the scheme, uh, the scheme will reduce maintenance costs and improve the, the, the appearance of the existing infrastructure in Bangor uh, and reduce the, the risk of the out-of-sewer uh, flooding during periods uh, of, of heavy rainfall. Thank you. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Question number three, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the decision to transfer off-street uh, parking functions from central government to the new councils uh, has been agreed by the executive as part of local government reform. Uh, in order to implement uh, this part of the executive's proposals under the review of public administration, or RPA, uh, my department proposes to issue an off-street parking uh, functions of district councils bill for consultation soon. It is scheduled to be introduced in, uh, to the Assembly in September. Uh, the bill will uh, would transfer to District Councils the powers my department has in relation to the provision, operation and management of off-street parking places under the Road uh, Traffic Regulation Northern Ireland Order 1997. The bill would also create certain decriminalised powers of enforcement to enable councils to issue penalty charge notices where parking contraventions occur in those car parks. Those powers would broadly reflect those available to my department under the Traffic Management Northern Ireland Order 2005. The bill would uh, come into effect on the 1st of April 2015. And I call Mr. Byrne for supplementary. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer and indeed welcome his announcement regarding the future of car parks and towns. Can the Minister state what level of income would these new super councils hope to earn? from having the responsibility for such car parks, and will the new super councils be in charge of arrangements and indeed local car parking charges for such? Okay. Grateful to the member for his um, uh, supplementary question. Um, can I say that um, over 300 free and charged car parks will uh, is an envisaged uh, transfer to the new councils with an, uh, an estimated value of some £46 million. Pounds. Now, that is uh, what they're worth, not what they earn, right? <laughs> need to be clear on that. Uh, and uh, work is ongoing to determine the final list of, of car parks that, uh, that will transfer. Uh, I think uh, in the region of uh, £8 million pounds per year is generated as a result uh, um, of those uh, car parks, those pay car parks. And I call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that the Committee have already been discussing uh, the proposals from the Department, 
and there has been uh, concern uh, from right around the committee in relation to the transfer of these assets without any apparent safeguards uh, set into the legislation uh, in terms of allowing uh, perhaps some very lucrative sites and city centres, etc., to be sold off uh, uh, and at a loss to the public purse. The figure that the committee was originally given was 300 million, but the minister is talking about 46 million today. What is the true figure, and what safeguards can be put in so that uh, public assets are protected uh, under the legislation? Grateful to the, uh, to the member uh, for his um, uh, sub, uh, for his supplementary question. Could I could I say that? Um, uh, and uh, he he raised this uh, with me uh, in a recent um, meeting. Um, a brief meeting um, uh, in relation to this issue. Uh, the, uh, I think we need to be um, aware that uh, councils um, have long sought powers uh, uh, in respect of, of uh, some DRD matters. Uh, the, the, the transfer of the car parks, I think, um, has been uh, at, the, at the lower end of that expectation, but nevertheless, it is our intention to transfer it. That legislation is due to come through this House. Um, I understand the point that he makes. I do say that I think uh, uh, he will be aware that um, car parking spaces um, in towns and indeed um, in Northern Ireland cities are, are, are sometimes at a premium, uh, just in terms of their need to have them provided as a public service. Uh, I would. I think uh, be concerned if, if councils uh, went down a road that would um, sell um, sites that would impact on uh, car parking arrangements for the wider public. And I think that's bound to uh, be a, a consideration that would weigh heavily on them before they would uh, uh, undertake um, any such course of action. I think uh, it is a matter, as I said, that will come before the House and whether or not mechanisms um, should be put in place. Uh, will be uh, decided and deliberated uh, upon at that stage. I call Mr. Declan Michael Lear. Uh, I'll go to the last uh, Could the Minister tell us that um, you know, there, there are um, people employed connected to car park, car park tenants, for example, who are employed by DRD? What will happen in situations when this um, uh, responsibility shifts to the, the councils? I'm grateful to um, the, the, the member for his uh, supplementary question. Um, the, the bill uh, will, will, will provide uh, councils with the powers to employ their own traffic uh, attendants. Um, some, local go uh, some local government representatives um, have inquired about uh, the possibility of my department's traffic attendants uh, continuing to provide an enforcement service for the new councils. Um, and uh, that, I think, arrangement has been recommended to councils by the R RPA Transfer of Functions Working Group and could certainly be put in place, but there are as yet no firm indications as to how uh, many, if any, of the new councils will wish uh, to, to proceed on that basis. And call Mr Ian McRae. Question number four. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the majority of grass areas within private housing developments are not adopted or maintained by uh, my department. Uh, consequently, responsibility for grass cutting lies with either the developer, the developer or the appointed managing agent. Uh, my department is responsible for cutting grass on areas of the public road network. In these instances, grass cutting is only carried out for road safety purposes or to prevent the overgrowth of roads and footways. My department does not cut grass for appearance or amenity purposes. If the member uh, has concerns regarding a specific area, um, he should contact uh, officials in my department who, who would be in a position to clarify responsibilities uh, in, in relation to grass cutting. Mr McRae for supplementary. Um, thank the Minister for his, for his response. Um, the Minister will know that you know, there are many um, private developers that um, are adopted, but unfortunately in some instances the developer is no longer there or indeed has went bust. So in circumstances like, like that, would the Minister, he has mentioned the sort of contracts that are available, would, would the Minister um, agree that 
that is the best way forward in, in setting up some type of maintenance contract for green areas with residents, and would his department be willing to um, be involved in that process? Thank the member for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, clearly, I, 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 I am somewhat loath to, um, to go down a route that, that, that would even um, potentially involve um, a, a expenditure um, uh, on that. Uh, it very much is the case that private developments and, and private developers are and should be responsible for proper maintenance regime. Um, in terms of, uh, of housing areas that, that they have created and um, have um, accrued some considerable financial benefit from in the sale of those houses. So I think very much the onus um, uh, uh, is for my department to perhaps um, uh, ensure that uh, developers live up to their responsibilities. Uh, and to that, agree, uh, to, to that extent, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm happy to assist with that. Mr. Phil Flanagan. Mr. I declare an interest as someone who lives in an area with about eight foot of uncut grass in front of his house. It's not my garden; it's the common area, of course. I would cut my grass. But can I ask the minister, in terms of a, a private development, um, which the the owner is now in, in administration or, or liquidation, um, can the minister provide any, any advice um, as to how? Householders can try and get that grass cut by whoever has the responsibility in that um, case, which is becoming more and more frequent in, in development. And I thank the member for his uh, supplementary question, and I, I would want to encourage him to, to continue to cut grass, uh, particularly uh, in, in public amenity areas. Uh, he, he will find it very, very therapeutic, because uh, I, 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 I cut grass in, in the front section of my own uh, uh, home, and technically. Technically, it belongs to the Department of Regional Development, <laughs> but I, 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 provide, I, see it as, I see it as public service. Um, so, uh, and, and World Cup commitments uh, aside, I, I would hope uh, to do some grass cutting tonight. But back to the, back to the basis of your, of, of your question, I think um, it is obviously there, are, there is legal recourse, or there should be legal recourse, uh, to those who find themselves in an unfortunate position where developers um, uh, uh, no longer exist um, and aren't um, in place anymore to provide um, the services that, that they are legally entitled to, to provide to, to householders. Um, I think it is a difficult one. It is akin to uh, the issues of um, where where developments remain unfinished as a consequence of uh, financial um, uh, uh, impact um, to developers, and, and, and one finds that either uh, uh, water services or, or uh, completing um, uh, the, the developments uh, becomes um, a real challenge. So, whilst I have sympathy for those who find themselves in that uh, situation, I, I do think uh, legal advice is probably the best way forward. I call Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Deputy, or Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer and his continuing interest in this subject. Uh, I know the word cups on, but could I suggest that it's not just the grass, it's the footpaths, it's the street lighting, it's the roads, it's the sewage, have left thousands of people in an awful dilemma following the collapse of the building industry some years ago. Can the Minister tell the House if we're any closer to legislation, which would in fact uh, protect those people who are the unfortunate victims of, of what happened and who may well not be watching the World Cup. I'm grateful to uh, Mr. Uh, Dallet for his uh, supplementary question. And maybe he's not a football fan, but I, I thought the World Cup so far has been very good. Um, and uh, what I would say, to be serious about it, um, I, I, I do understand uh, uh, the. The, the importance of this issue, particularly to householders who find themselves um, living in estates which are unfinished, uh, and, and the prospects of, of pursuing um, legal uh, issues is not perhaps uh, an attractive one or a financially, um, uh, you know, uh, one that is that is uh, beneficial to them. Uh, what I would say, I continue to have ongoing discussions with. Um, the various uh, parties involved, including officials from my own department and indeed the Law Society and um, the, um, the construction industry, 
to see how the, 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 these legacy issues, if you like, can be addressed. But it is not easy. It is a challenge, not least the potential uh, bill and uh, the cost that would be involved in upgrading uh, and putting right um, uh, estates and housing developments um, all over Northern Ireland. And call Mr. Biggs. require considerable ongoing maintenance. So my question is, uh, <coughs> Minister, uh, are you aware of any proposals to ensure that all potential new homeowners are aware of any ongoing costs that would be associated with such maintenance? And is he aware of any proposals from the Department of Finance or the Office of Law Reform to give greater, greater clarity on this issue and which will ensure that there will be a better management of such proposals with lower administrative costs to homeowners? Grateful to the member for the, uh, the point that he raises, and, uh, uh, and I think uh, it's a point that is worthy of consideration to those agencies that he has uh, mentioned, not least uh, those with, with legal responsibilities um, as they advise their, 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 their clients and potential uh, uh, homeowners. Uh, I think that uh, is basically where the responsibility should remain. Uh, and that uh, because um, I don't uh, uh, envisage um, uh, my department being in a financial position uh, to, um, on a widespread basis, uh, to um, uh, take up uh, the work and undertake the work uh, that um, has been promised um, for by um, either uh, the, the house sellers or the, the private developers or indeed uh, their legal representatives. Thank you. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. And remind you that Mr Wilson is behind you. Uh, number five. Uh, the new policy, Road Safety at Schools, which will be authorised uh, this summer, will provide for the installation of part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at schools in all areas. The schools will be prioritised um, according to the level of perceived risk with those located on roads where the national speed limit applies attracting a higher priority. The implementation of schemes will commence this financial year with the number being completed dependent upon the availability of funding. Campbell for Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And my being in the chamber one hour and 20 minutes after leaving Royal Portrush Golf Club proves that I went more than 20 miles an hour, but I didn't uh, exceed the speed limit. Could I uh, thank the Minister for his response, but uh, can I indicate to him that there are a number of small rural schools adjacent to uh, quite significant uh, roadways where speeding does occur from time to time, and that those should be at the very top of the priority list when he's looking at uh, trying to ascertain which schools should be first in the list for any reduction in speed limits such as this one. I'm grateful to the, to the member for his uh, uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, and I won't um, question him more closely on the speed that he drives at uh, from uh, on the very good network that uh, we have provided in DRD. Um, could, could, <laughs> could, I, could I say that, um, uh, as I have indicated, all, all schools will be consider, uh, considered in line with the school uh, assessment sheet, regardless of, of what measures are already installed. Um, now, there, obviously, um, there, there are some schools which have had safety engineering measures installed within the last five years, uh, and um, there has been considerable investment um, um, provided there. Uh, and therefore, um, perhaps available resources would be better targeted at, at other schools where there are currently no or older measures installed. But uh, we will uh, take careful uh, consideration of, um, of all of these uh, as, uh, uh, as we move forward. Thank you. And that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, with the road and pavement works about to start in the Valley Hackamore area for the Belfast Rapid Transit Scheme in the next couple of weeks, what other work is going on um, in the background in his department to make sure that the service will be fully embraced and successful when it is operational in 2017? I'm grateful to the member for her um, 
uh, sub, uh, for her, her topical question on, on the issue of Belfast uh, rapid transit. Uh, obviously, um, uh, this is something that I think uh, has the potential to transform public transport uh, in, uh, in Belfast, initially uh, between uh, East and West Belfast, and then hopefully extend it uh, um, across all areas uh, of Belfast. Uh, the member will know that we are, have started work on the new park and ride uh, facility at Dundonald, um, and we, um, we uh, continue to, to, uh, to carry forward um, uh, work in, in that general area. Work is due to start next week on the section of Belfast Rapid Transport uh, route on the Upper Newton Arge Road between Sandown Road and Knock Road. This work will include minor carriageway widening to facilitate the future introduction of bus lanes in both directions for BRT, uh, the resurfacing of almost one kilometre of carriageway and adjoining footways will also be undertaken, along with works to improve pedestrian crossing facilities. The scheme is pro uh, programmed to ensure that as much of the work uh, as possible in Ballyhackamore is undertaken over the summer months, uh, when traffic levels uh, uh, are, are lower and the schools are on holiday. So, I hope that's a flavour and an indication. Uh, of the approach that we are adopting uh, to uh, the work of uh, BRT and indeed uh, in the area of Ballyhackamore. Ms Cochrane, for supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. Would the Minister agree that the key to uh, BRT being successful is getting more traffic off the road? And one way to do this um, would be to offer free public transport to all school children. And further to the motion that I brought to the House in February 2013, has there been any, uh, any progress on um, the feasibility study and to making this a reality? Well, I'm grateful to the member for her supplementary question and uh, I well remember the uh, debate that we uh, had uh, in the House um, uh, in relation to this. Um, I, I, I do have to say that you know, public even free public transport does not come without cost uh, and I think we have to be realistic about that and I know the member would want me to be realistic about that uh, and we would have to give very serious consideration to um, um, an extension of that because of, of, the, of the pressures uh, that, we, that we currently find. Uh, and I have to say that uh, there are substantial issues before the executive which are not resolved. Uh, I can think of at least three issues in both education uh, and ESA and the whole debate around that uh, in terms of uh, welfare reform and indeed cap reform uh, in agriculture. All of those have the potential to impact on future budgetary settlements and the financial position of not just the departments involved, but other departments, including my own. And so um, I, I'm cautious when it comes to, to adding uh, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the size of the financial requirements that I need to run my uh, department effectively and efficiently. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I would ask the Minister to advise what protocols are in place to allow um, local management to discuss um, various problems with elected officials. Thank the member for his uh, supplementary, uh, or sorry, for his topical question. And I mean, I do uh, consider myself to be. Um, uh, to have a minister with an open door policy. Uh, and I think the member uh, uh, knows that, and, uh, and others uh, in this House know that. Uh, and, but also to encourage that uh, through the work of my officials uh, as a liaise uh, either with public bodies or indeed public representatives. And, uh, and I think there is, there, there is huge benefit uh, to be gained uh, in um, uh, greater coordination and cooperation between government departments and, uh, uh, and, and agencies with not only the public at large but their public representatives. Sir Leslie Cree for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his uh, that response. Um, Minister, do you think therefore it is helpful that um, with the local dialogue whenever cases like the South Eastern Area Headquarters, which you did touch upon, has now been moved to Craig Avon, is that really helping the dialogue with local people? Well, the member will uh, know uh, and, uh, and appreciate that uh, issues around RPA uh, were not. Uh, um, there were issues around RPA that um, 
uh, the Ulster Unionist Party, of which both of us belong to, um, did not agree with, uh, and again, uh, and that included the number uh, of, of new councils. Uh, we favoured um, the, uh, 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 making them um, uh, coterminous with uh, both parliamentary uh, and, um, uh, and assembly boundaries. Um, that argument, however, did not carry the day. And now we are in a situation where I think that, uh, in some cases, um, it is hard to see how local government means local government because of distances that uh, have now to be travelled, not only by the elected members, but in terms of uh, some of the services. So I think I, like him, will be very interested uh, as we approach the implementation, uh, the full implementation of RPA uh, due next April 2015, as to how that will impact and truly relate to people uh, on the ground. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with road service in Straban to try to resolve the ongoing traffic chaos in Straban caused by the closures of the A5 Victoria Road and the one-way system within Bridge Street? I'm grateful to the uh, member for her um, question. and Indeed, uh, she um, has raised this matter uh, uh, with me. Uh, directly, I think, uh, uh, in the House. Uh, she will know that um, environmental improvement schemes, wherever they are, uh, can uh, bring a certain degree of traffic disruption and inconvenience. Every effort um, is made to ease the situation, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that includes at Bridge Street, uh, uh, Straban, uh, to restore two way traffic flows there as quickly as possible. Um, to safely carry out the reconstruction of the footways on Bridge Street uh, and uh, uh, provide proper temporary provision for pedestrians and safe working space for the works, uh, it is necessary to, to fence off part of the carriageway. The options for traffic management in this scenario were carefully considered at the planning stage. The introduction of the temporary one-way system to Bridge Street was considered to be the option, option that would bring the least amount of disruption, and this in turn uh, meant for uh, most of the time a single lane available for traffic. Um, at the planning stage, my officials in Transport NI um, examined the possibility of utilising traffic lights and also a stop-go arrangement. Um, however, such arrangements would have led to greater disruption due to tailbacks on both approaches to, uh, on Bridge Street and into adjoining uh, junctions. Ms Boyle for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that? Um, given the demographic of Straban and the ongoing roadworks now on the A5 Victoria Road between Balamagori and Straban, um, would the Minister agree that it was a lack of joined up thinking by road service um, to start the roadworks on the A5 Balamagori to Straban when the roadworks were still continuing in Bridge Street? And I say that given the demographic of Straban. I'm grateful to the member uh, for her uh, supplementary question, but uh, the answer is no, I, 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 I wouldn't agree with that. I think careful consideration has been given. The point that I have made is that sometimes you can't make omelettes without breaking eggs. Um, the, the, the work to the, to the bridge was particularly necessary. Uh, I can say that um, two-way traffic flow was reintroduced for one day on Saturday, the 7th of June and uh, will be introduced uh, and, and again was introduced on, on the 14th to ease the situation for the Summer Jam Festival um, held in the town centre. Uh, and so we, we have, the contractor has sought uh, to, to ease congestion wherever possible, but when work is necessary, then I'm afraid some levels of inconvenience um, are uh, unavoidable, um, and I hope that uh, the member will accept that. And I'm sure that uh, the public will, will um, in overall terms, um, accept the benefits that we are trying to, to, uh, to make to the road network in Estreban Centre and the approaches to it. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Free. Thank you, Mr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, given the, the very best of news that we have received today, that Royal Port Rush will indeed uh, be placed on the rota to host the Open Championship in Gulf, uh, and we could well be hosting it by 2019, and we also have the potential to host even more uh, opens in the future. Uh, given all of that good news, will the Minister give a commitment to this House today that he will look and consider, given, he, given that he has time, 
Will he consider uh, putting investment to an even greater uh, amount to the A26 and the railway line going to Port Rush uh, and, of course, investment in the stations uh, from Belfast to Port Rush and from Larne to Port Rush to make sure the infrastructure is in place for the open? Grateful to the member for his, uh, his question. And indeed, uh, it is indeed tremendous news. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the whole House uh, rejoices uh, in the fact that uh, it is now indicated that, uh, that, that the Open um, uh, will be held um, in Royal Portrush uh, hopefully in 2019. And of course we, we had the huge success of the Irish Open in 2012 and it is worth remembering that we are due to have a return visit um, of the Irish Open uh, in Portrush uh, even before 2019 uh, and indeed uh, to uh, Royal County Down um, and, the new, and the South Down area um, in, in, in 2015. So uh, I think uh, it, it is very important indeed that uh, overall infrastructure uh, and transport in, uh, infrastructure is improved. Uh, I'm very happy and proud to say, uh, as an Ulster Unionist Minister, that um, we, we were to bring forward the scheme uh, that will see um, the upgrading of the, of the A26 process. Uh, with, with, with monies and with the good intent that uh, Mr. Frew has, has indicated from his party, I think around the executive table I can look forward with confidence to getting more money to perhaps um, improve that network of, of roads uh, further. Um, and of course, um, the member will know that uh, the, uh, the Coleraine London Dairy Line uh, was saved and effectively rescued by this minister and by this political party. So we are very uh, conscious of, of the role that we have uh, and, and the importance of it, and we look forward to confidence that, uh, that, that, that we will be supported around the executive table as we bid for, for further funds to improve further the, the road network. I call Mr. Free for a supplementary. Again, I thank the Minister for his commitment that he will uh, lobby the Executive for additional funding for my constituents in North Antrim and the neighbouring constituencies. Uh, Paul, ticking aside, Minister, can you also give an assurance to this House that any advancements in the area around Port Rush will also be compatible with the North West 200? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Frew, for your, for your supplementary question. And, and again, um, I, I think the record shows that, that I, uh, as Minister, have given considerable support uh, to the North West uh, 200. I've even had the experience, and I'm not sure if he has, uh, of, of having uh, ridden the course. Uh, so I, I say, as a rider, uh, that, I am, <laughs> uh, that I am always very uh, aware of, 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 of the North West. 200 and its importance not only to the regional economy uh, of, 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 uh, of, of the North West but indeed to Northern Ireland generally uh, and I continue to, uh, to be very optimistic uh, as we go forward in supporting events like the North West 200 and indeed the Ulster Grand Prix and other road racing events. Mr Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and could I ask um, uh, the Minister for his view of the, the, the cost and economic terms of the use of electricity and the treatment of water? Well, can I say to the member and thank him for the question that electricity costs NIW some £34 million uh, uh, a year. Uh, this figure, I think, will, will, will only increase uh, in future years unless we actively uh, explore ways to reduce uh, the quantity of water entering the system and sources uh, of renewable energy. We simply um, we, we, we cannot simply treat larger and larger quantities uh, of wastewater. We are going to have to be clever uh, in, in our approach to these issues. Copeland, for some... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, rather quickly, would the Minister agree with me that the promotion of sustainable drainage solutions could be viewed as an excellent means not only of reducing energy costs but of reducing flood risk as well? Well, I'm grateful to the, to, to the member uh, for his uh, interesting uh, supplementary question, and it is uh, because of, of his representation of East Belfast and having had to deal with uh, historic flooding uh, issues that it is relevant. Uh, and I do certainly agree that we need to promote uh, sustainable drainage solutions, not only in new developments, but, uh, but wherever possible, 
retrofit uh, existing areas to make better use uh, of these practical solutions. And during my uh, recent um, cycling study visit to, to Copenhagen, uh, I, I, I met with a Danish water provider uh, and visited some of their forward-thinking uh, SUDS uh, projects. Uh, and these projects have not only reduced the burden in some cases on water treatment, but also have, as he has indicated, uh, reduced flood risk. So we have much to learn and much to apply ourselves to. Order and time is up.